And now we elaborate on what they say are the real reasons for Finance Minister's court action. Acting CEO of Oak Bay Investments, Ronika Raghavan, says the minister used an irrelevant and fundamentally flawed list of transactions to further his warfare against Oak Bay and its shareholders. She says Godan used both his office and the resources of the state to pursue this and why the minister is using Oak Bay as a pawn for his own political purpose is a mystery to Oak Bay. And perhaps it's uh, to try and protect the banking sector from future future scrutiny into its conduct and either way it is reckless and inappropriate. The group now hopes that the courts would do justice to their plea. And joining us uh, on the phone line, Marius Dutoy, a criminal attorney, Sviso Mathango, residential political analyst. Marius, good evening to you and thanks so much for joining us. Now, court uh, has set uh, the verdict aside uh, in this matter whether uh, the Minister of Finance could intervene in the bank uh, in Oak Bay relations or rather accounts of matter. What is your assessment so far of the arguments on both sides? Well, I think, Cindy, it's been a very interesting two days. I mean, I think there's never a dry moment in our politics. But having said that, you know, one must understand where the premise was of this application. The premise was our minister required clarity as to whether he should have intervened or whether he was forced to intervene. And in this instance, Oak Bay's lawyers made it clear that they never sought that. They're just saying that as a minister, he had a duty to say, well, listen, I should intervene here because, uh, due to public interest. And it's interesting when you look at the public at large, Cindy, we often see ministers intervene in matters. I mean, we see this when we have labor disputes or labor strikes. We see the minister intervening and meeting with uh, labor brokers or meeting with both sides in an attempt to, re to reach a resolve. Um, we see that with the minister of sport who often meets with the, the different... Um, sports venues or sports institutions to try and resolve certain disputes. So it's nothing uncommon for the minister to intervene and say, well, listen, I should intervene. But in this instance, uh, we have the minister of finance deciding that he should not intervene and he should get an order to confirm that he cannot be forced or that he shouldn't intervene. And when you look at that, you have to say to yourself, why was this necessary in the first place? Is it due to the fact that he felt pressure because he feel that he might, be the, he might not be the Minister of Finance going forward, or that in the day it might be seen that he was against um, the, the Oak Bay or the, or the Gupta brothers in this instance. So it's been really interesting, but it's been a very complex argument, Cindy. So it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds. It, it could possibly go either way. Let's get a view from Sviso Matlango. As, as Marius was saying, it is a, a rather complex and proving whether there was undue pressure and whether this is the right route for the minister to go and the implications it will have for future engagements between the private sector and government. Well, if uh, Mr. Gordon were to win this case, uh, and I don't know when the court ruling comes out, if he'll still be the minister, it would be very interesting what we call that when the court ruling comes out and the man is no longer a minister, uh, if it was a ministerial ap uh, uh, application. In the first place, if Mr. Gordon wins this, it will be the banks saying that, um, the courts rather saying that the banks can uh, intrude on a person's privacy whenever they will. It will be the banks uh, not affording South Africans the right or the responsibility to keep their accounts. And that is not to suggest that there can be untoward behavior. Uh, or con you know, controversial or suspicious transactions made. Uh, Mr. Gordon suggested there were some uh, suspicious transactions in the Oak Bay account, but he couldn't prove it. In fact, the courts have not brought that out. And so if he were to win the case, I think the courts in South Africa were to be suggesting very heavily that the banks in this country can do whatever they want, and uh, our finance minister... Uh, cannot protect the, the individuals in this country. I think the matter at hand is uh, why our minister got the, the, the FIC certificate, why he deemed it uh, necessary. And then he presented the certificate, ran a large allegations that uh, in the Oak Bay business account, there were some illegal or suspicious uh, transactions, something that he couldn't prove. And uh, Oak Bay has said... But we never even asked the minister to get involved. Why does he run to the court and uh, demand a declaratory order on something 
we never asked him to get involved in in the first place. So is this a matter of Mr. Gordon protecting the banks? Uh, because surely it would suggest to me that what he's saying is, uh, I don't want to intrude in a bank and client matter in case the banks in this country have to account on why uh, they closed a particular family or particular company's account. When a bank closes my account, I'd like to know why they are closing them. So if Mr. Gordon is running to the bank's rescue and saying, well, the banks don't have to account, I'm going to account on their behalf, uh, uh, you know, a via a, a declaratory order. Hold on, Mr. Gordon, I would say, you're the finance minister, you're not the, the CEO of the bank, although th there's a very thin line at the moment. Yeah. And so I think if, if, uh, if Mr. Gordon won this, the, the courts would be running at a very thin line because I don't think South Africans would ever be protected with regard to these mighty and powerful banks in this country. But I think the courts room have seen beyond this and the political agenda that Mr. Gordon has been uh, pushing for a long time has been made visible. Mm. And I don't think he, he will win this round. Yeah. Uh, Marius, I mean, you, you know, we're talking about a Pandora's box potentially opening here. But, uh, I mean, the, the case of uh, the Pravin Gordon was resting very much on this Financial Intelligence Center certificate that uh, reveals suspicious accounts or, you know, transactions, 72 of them. That has, was thrown out from day one. But in, in the interest, on the public interest, which is what the counsel for Mr. Gordon was insisting on, of what value? with this irrelevant and fundamentally flawed document uh, would have been anyway? Yeah, I think once again, Cindy, we have to go back and ask ourselves, why was this application from the word go actually necessary? You know, if you, maybe Minister Gordon felt that he was being interfered with, that pressure was placed on him by the powers to be to interfere in a matter. And let me just say, you know, Zafisa was, was touching on the issue of the banks doing what they want with your accounts. The moment there is suspicious transactions going through your account, uh, the banks have to comply with FICA legislation and they have to immediately intervene. So if there is suspicious transactions, they've got a duty to intervene. But having said that, in this instance, we're not dealing here with the individual. We're dealing here with potentially affecting thousands of employees. So taking a decision by the banks to say we're not doing business with you because we believe that you are aligned with uh, the poison chalice being the Gupta family, then suddenly you have a scenario that, all right, fine, should the minister in that sense intervene to save jobs? Or should he perhaps get involved and say, guys, in the interest of justice, due to the fact that I'm the minister, maybe in this instance it's called for that I should, I should intervene. But I believe that Minister Gordon was perhaps concerned that it might seem that he is biased or it might seem that he's favoring a specific party. And hence he took the decision to say, I'm not going to interfere. And to just enforce what I've done, I'm going to try and get an order to say that my rights or future rights or contingent rights are in fact clear and should be endorsed by the court. So he perhaps went to court to try and get uh, not clarity as such, but of course endorsement for the action that he has taken. No, but I mean, this, this blanket declaratory order and the impact that it will have on the powers of the president and the executive going forward, albeit that uh, Prime Minister Pravin Gordon may not be in that post anymore. Uh, what, what are the, the, the ramifications thereof, Marius? Well, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how this unfolds. I mean, of course, we must remember that the president is of course the executive power in the country and he can can act as he wishes like you could recall minister gordon it might not be good but he can do so if he believes it's in the interest of his cabinet but having said that if this is in fact an order that says that the minister of finance should not have intervened in this instance and that he was right to do so of course we'll have ramifications because it could be applied to the other ministerial departments Suddenly we could have a situation where government will say, well, listen, we have to look carefully at this because even though it's applicable to Minister of Finance, it might equally apply to the other departments. And suddenly we might have to review where we want to intervene in situations. And suddenly you have to ask yourself, well, what powers does the minister then has? If he's not there to intervene in his department because he is the head of that department countrywide. If he's not able to intervene and say, listen, in the interest of justice, guys, can't we review this? Then, then you have to ask what powers do they in fact have? So it could become a lame duck. 
Okay, hold on the line. As, as free, so just the whole argument uh, that the finance minister felt that he was pressured and duly so to intervene, and the, the Oak Bay correspondence does prove that there had been engagement, but at no point a call for action per se, but, uh, you know, a, a sense of what do we do now as, as finance minister? Do you, you think know, that that point came across? strange because I was looking at that. I had gotten some questions and some answers listening to... Uh, to, to the events of the courtroom. And incidentally, the question you're asking is the one I had particular interest in. Mm. Uh, the finance minister gave two reasons to the FIC mm -hmm. to gain access into, into the, the FIC certificate. So he had said he went to the Financial Intelligence Center in his capacity as the Minister of Finance. And he said to, to the Financial Intelligence Center he needed the certificate for um, the, the Oak Bay accounts because he wanted to find out why the banks closed the, the Oak Bay accounts. If in fact there was some untoward behavior or some uh, suspicious transactions. Then now his representation in court says uh, Mr. Gordon had no desire to enter between the bank and their client's uh, business. I've seen various videos where Mr. Gordon spoke to other news agencies and various uh, reporters where he said it is not his role to get into the bank and their clients. So why in fact did he go to the Financial Intelligence Center and why did he get that certificate if it was not to probe? So then he later applies for a declaratory order and uh, says I cannot get involved when he went to the FIC, got the certificate and told them he was doing this to get involved. So to the FIC, Mr. Gordon says he's attempting very much to get involved in the matter between the Guptas and the banks. And to the courts, he says he has no desire to, to entertain the matter between Oak Bay and the banks. So at what point is Mr. Gordon telling the truth? All right, let's get a legal perspective, Marius. Uh, just on, on that part, the loophole uh, with regards to the fact-finding mission that Mr. Gordon had gone on to and now trying to prove that there was undue pressure uh, and uh, essence duress for him to get involved. Yeah, in essence, I think, uh, Cindy, what we have here is a minister trying to vindicate his actions. So he has attempted by doing this to say at the end of the day, guys, you know, even though I might not be the Minister of Finance tomorrow, I want to take the moral high ground and show everybody that uh, what I did was correct. And nobody should put pressure on me to prove otherwise. So this was without a doubt an attempt by Minister Gordon to take the moral high ground in this matter. And of course, if he fails, of course, that would all be futile. But I think that is in essence what this is about. This is, even though we might have a court case here and we think legal principles apply, but in essence, we have a political uh, game of, of chess going on here. Yeah, and Marius, as a result, sorry, just the for question clarity, is who's got just, who in checkmate here. Yeah, just for, for clarity on the point of the Financial Intelligence Center certificate with these so-called suspicious transactions, that in essence what the minister is trying to do is say he, he's been very open and cordial with the Oak Bay group that he cannot get involved, uh, separation of powers or whatever other motivation. But then he goes and, go and in, inquires about this fake uh, certificate corresponds with them very nicely and, and at no point was there it was can it be proven that there was duress i'm just saying as we stand now um, what does this mean for kodan's case no no i believe you make a very good argument sydney i mean it, it definitely begs the question as to how can you argue in the one vein that i'm not supposed to intervene but in the same token i am intervening and that will of course go against your credibility of your application but having said that, our FICA legislation is definitely in line with world standards and is very strict. And, and as a result, I believe that uh, if FICA intervenes and believe that there's suspicious transactions, and let me just say, there's an obligation on any financial institution to report it. So if they believed, bona fide, that there was legitimate reason for them to report it, they were obligated to report it. And that would have resulted in the accounts being frozen. Okay, so in this instance, line, my even though friend, I agree that it does yeah. reflect on his credibility. We'll just engage my learned friend here, Siso uh, Matlao. In terms of the inter-ministerial inter committee that was supposed to, to be formed uh, with regards to looking into the whole bank 
conduct and hopefully come up with a judiciary inquiry on the uh, monopoly and et cetera. Do you think that this application would scupper the, the um, IMC going forward? Well, this application would have to show that uh, there was a very deep political game uh, and uh, Mr. Gordon had masterminded it. Uh, I do hope that a judicial commission of inquiry uh, was uh, created by the president. Um, that would also help in matters of collusion. In, it would also, uh, you know, finally put the, the last letters of the APSA bailout, that which APSA and many other organizations are still very quiet on. It would talk about the monopolies um, that, that have happened uh, pre-democracy and even post-democracy. And it, I think it would be a strong arm against white monopoly capital. Um, if we had a judicial commission of inquiry that exposed um, these matters, I think it would be very beneficial to the country. Um, just, just last week on Straight Talk, I had uh, Ms. Thingwim uh, Kize, the Deputy Minister of Telecommunications and Postal Services. She was actually a commissioner uh, for the TRC. And I often pose the question to her to say, do we now need an economic TRC? Do we need a, a, a judicial commission of inquiry to learn about the, the economic uh, ad, ad, adversities that happened and the trajectories that happened uh, pre-democracy and even post-democracy, many by the banks? So whilst I welcome that call, um, this just proves that this just wasn't a bank voluntarily looking into suspicious behavior because there are no suspicious transactions that have been identified. These were the banks, uh, headed also by Minister Gordon, uh, that got the tip off to say, in, like in that meeting where the, the heads of business were, let's clip the wings of the Gupta family. And a few phone calls were made and uh, people were told to shut their accounts, and that's exactly what happened. All right, we're going to leave it there. Sviso Matango, resident uh, political analyst, and we had Maria Stutoy, criminal attorney.